Uh, we're so deeply thankful to have Charles here as a speaker. Uh, his talk will be entitled Regenerative Agriculture, Profound Solutions for Challenging Times. So Charles, over to you. Morning, everyone. And uh, my thanks to Grassfed Exchange and Russ for those words and uh, for Alan and all the work that they do and, and thank you for that great welcome to country which, as was pointed out, we do at home. And I think it's important as a reminder for us as landscape managers uh, to remember uh, why we're here and how we got here. So what I'd like to do today is uh, take you on a a broad canter across a wide landscape and then get into some details. Because the, uh, I think the great issues confronting us as a society, as a planet and with human health, we collectively in this room provide many of the very best solutions to those major challenges and that to me is incredibly exciting and I just want to walk you through, through some of those issues. if we can get it to work. All right, so my message is pretty simple. If we regenerate healthy landscapes, from that we get healthy food and fibre, and that in turn means healthy profits, people, and a healthy planet. Sounds a big claim, but I'm going to demonstrate why I'm, I'm making it. So when I'm talking about regenerative agriculture, I'm talking about not just sustaining landscapes, but renewing them. And it's across a range of issues from what most of us here are involved in, ecological, holistic grazing, right across the new biological approaches to cropping and so on. What that regeneration does is enables nature to self-organise herself to a space to which uh, uh, under the soil and above, uh, those ecosystems co-evolve. So I'll start, if you like, with the bad news. Uh, big context number one. Um, as you can see from uh, those rats, they're discovering we're not in a great position. Uh, we're on base still, doing a bit of lecturing occasionally at the Australian National University down the corridor are some of the world's leaders in earth system science and climate systems. They're getting more depressed by the day. And it's undoubtedly now, the evidence is just so overwhelming and the consensus in the high 90% that human activity, hence anthropo, we have pushed the earth into a new geological epoch because we've destabilised the nine integrated self-organising earth systems that sustain conditions for life. And that's why it's called the Anthropocene. And in my view, it's the greatest crisis our species has ever faced. Uh, diminishes, as important as they were, things like world wars. This is the greatest challenge. And on the left, you can see this unique blue-green planet. It's blue-green because life created conditions for life. It, there's only one in, uh, in the solar system, and almost certainly so far that we know in the universe. And about 3.2 billion years ago, bacteria first put oxygen up into the atmosphere. And then once over, around about 450 million years ago, algae, lichens, and then uh, fungi got onto the land and started to break down rocks and create soil. A bit over 400 million years ago, the great forest started to regulate the carbon dioxide cycle. So that unique planet is created by life. But now there's one species are uh, starting to destabilise it, and, and uh, that's us. We call ourselves Homo sapiens sapiens. I'm not so sure whether that's the correct description. It's all right, I'm the wrong date of birth for this sort of technology. Um, why we've got into, the greater, into this Anthropocene dilemma is what's called the Great Acceleration post the Second World War 1950s with the rise of industrial capitalism and then the lunacy of economic rationalism, growth for the sake of growth, which means endless destruction. A whole lot of social phenomena on the left in orange, whether it was population or GDP, uh, 
the rise of McDonald's um, and fast food outlets, whatever, uh, they all sort of went off on an exponential curve. And same on the right side, the earth system trends, whether it was uh, uh, different chemicals being put into the atmosphere, destruction of biodiversity, overuse of water. And that's what's behind this Anthropocene dilemma. And as you can see, this is uh, the fourth largest sea in the world, bigger than most of your Great Lakes. And industrial agriculture for cotton, in this case, uh, ended up draining entirely uh, and polluting uh, that huge area. So we humans are pretty good at destabilising systems. <coughs> I'm not going to go into the detail, but these are the nine integrated Earth systems that we now understand that maintains the conditions for life some of them in red, into really dangerous territory. But the ones I want to point out are, are the, the ones directly in the biophysical area of climate, biodiversity, land systems change, freshwater use, and the integrated nitrogen and phosphorus uh, flow boundary cycles. The evidence now, and a huge amount published, will show you that it's industrial agriculture is a major, if not the major player, in destabilising those six key systems. But there's a converse to that. If industrial agriculture got that, has done that, the flip side is regenerative agriculture can undo and heal it. And to me, that's the great grounds for hope. Uh, we can pull down the carbon dioxide, we can address uh, biodiversity and other issues. And uh, that's what's so exciting about this space. So how do we get into this mess? Uh, you'll notice I've put a hyphen between agri and culture because it's, as one farmer said, it's this dangerous square foot of real estate between our ears, our, our worldviews and attitudes, how we farm and how we treat earth. And uh, <coughs> so one of the things when I look at our landscape at home and talk to a, a senior indigenous lawman, what you would call a medicine man who has collective memory, Within about three decades, our country was settled in the 1820s, where I live, a, a lovely temperate grassland. And through overgrazing and then later ploughing, we destroyed what's called the small water cycle, that really important local cycling of water, where plants transpire and you get mists and fogs. And when the white settlers and surveyors came in and their, their records, a bit like yours here, that the grasslands were hugely diverse and spongy, and there's uh, records uh, that, that even on summer days into midday, there was mists and fogs. You went for a ride on a horse, you, your legs were soaked from the knee down. Within decades, that was all destroyed. Uh, the grasslands set stocked and disappeared, incised creeks draining the lifeblood out of the land. And there's an important historical precedent we need to think about. Our form of Western agriculture evolved in the Middle East in what's called the Fertile Crescent, that green crescent there. Uh, today's Iran, Iraq, those sort of countries. 10 to 12,000 years ago when they domesticated those weedy annual plants called cereals, from which our modern cereals have come, etc., and they domesticated sheep and goats. You had beautiful, healthy, diverse grasslands, you had rich alluvial flats, and much of the Mediterranean was forested. And then over time, that was all turned into desert, the process of desertification. And here we've got even Plato having a good complaint, 360 BC, how the hills around Athens had been eroded and it was like the skeleton of a sick man, all the fat and soft earth having been wasted away. <coughs> Look at that country today. Iran, Iraq, Syria, Libya, top end of Africa, the Sahil, Chad, all desert, all in constant drought, and huge social conflict. And when I travel widely across Australia, and I suspect it applies partly here, our landscapes, due to a brief European settlement, are on that path of desertification to different stages, some of it already like the Middle East. And, and we're just not seeing it. And uh, it's something we have to acknowledge and I'm saying we can turn around. And that, I won't go into the details, but that's due to what happened 
after the, re the Renaissance and the rise of the scientific revolution, the industrial revolution and then the capitalist revolution, prior on the left, our indigenous communities and even the medieval peasant that Bruegel paints there in the, in the 1500s, <coughs> they had an organic mind. They saw the, themselves and their societies as indivisible from Mother Earth, the Great Mother. We then went through that scientific revolution and that industrial process where we now see ourselves as separate to Mother Earth. She's some substrate from which we extract profits. And that's the fatal schism that has occurred and that's landed us in this dilemma. And that's a classic case. And I can show you later some, we're, we're as good as you guys at doing this. But that was once, as I understand, tall grass prairie, uh, overgrazed and then the plough was put into it. And that's a classic process of desertification. <coughs> and if you look at the available land use on our globe, we've already, as an agricultural species, degraded 35% of that. Five out of more than 14 uh, million hectares, billion hectares globally. And that's the plough and overgrazing of animals. So answering those questions there, yeah, we've got it wrong. And, and we, but we know the solutions. And so I'm arguing very powerfully we are in denial about this desertification process. We just can't see it or we don't want to acknowledge it. And our ongoing industrial practices are exacerbating it. And so there is another way and that's why we're all here today. And, uh, and that's why I, I state we can, through regenerative agriculture, heal these issues and people at the same time. And that's what we're going to hear tonight from uh, the wonderful Zach Bush. And if you want to put it in one slide, that's it. Regenerating this extraordinary life underneath, which then relates to the life above. And that's our healthy soils. So we can, as I said earlier, restore our farms, soils, ecosystems and profits but not with monocultures of plants. Nature isn't up to monocultures. But with multi-species cover crops, perennial cover crops, uh, many of which you are familiar with, and those diverse perennial grasslands. But all those three practices optimally need animals regeneratively grazing through them to maximise that. So let's get on to the solutions. <coughs> um, and I can tell you from painful experience, the first step really is for us to, to get some ecological literacy, which is to understand how landscapes function. So our current industrial paradigm is that, if you like, nature's the enemy. We've got a dominator, control her, which has led to all those problems. That picture on the left is an advertisement for glyphosate, Roundup, about six years ago in the big national daily, weekly dailies, rural dailies across Australia an aggressive white pointer. The roundup drum, if you look closely, is a sexy face with big eyelids, smiling face. You've got to bear in mind the big multinationals employ psychologists to press the buttons on people like us. If you read the fine print there, it says, trust your killer instincts. <clears throat> my own journey was I had to leave university at the age of 22 <clears throat> when my father got ill and died and take over a farm, having grown up there, I knew bugger all how to manage it. So I asked the best advice around, uh, best farmers, scientists, Department of Agriculture. I became a good industrial farmer, which meant I set stocks, I ploughed country, and for a year or so, I used chemicals uh, across the landscape to put in pasture. I was so ecologically literate, I could drive past that landscape on the left and not realise it should have been in hospital in intensive care. It was ill, terminally ill. Uh, I had no understanding of how the landscape functioned and how I should nurture that. And that's part of our uh, native grassland, temperate grassland where I live, basalt. That's a fence between two neighbours. You're all familiar with that. On the um, on the right side is set stocked. On the left is uh, a neighbour go, uh, going into regenerative agriculture. 
That's a barbed wire fence. I've straddled that at times and it's bloody uncomfortable, I can assure you. Um, and I like to think I'm now on the left side, but that, that absolutely sums up that square foot of real estate. The paradigms we carry from, from we've learned from family or university or college or whatever. Unbelievably powerful. And any of you who've done savoury training, holistic management, um, would be familiar with some of the the first four key landscape functions. And plenty of other ecologists will emphasise that. I've added the fifth, that weird bunch of organisms down on the right, we humans. Um, so we're all familiar with the solar function, the water cycle, soil mineral cycle, biodiversity. But if you look at the arrows in that diagram, everything is interconnected, back to the humans particularly. And if we destabilise any one of those key functions, everything is affected. If you regenerate any one of those, they all regenerate together. And it's these that undergird our ecosystems and our entire civilization. And they're the ones that we've just destabilised and destroyed. <clears throat> so I'm just not going to go into the theory. I'm going to skip through and illustrate elements of these, but bear in mind they're all crossovers into the others. So <clears throat> we all know about photosynthesis. Um, solar panels on plants, grabbing carbon dioxide, turning it into sugars to feed both the plant, but particularly the soil uh, biological world underneath. So I see my role as a manager is to stack on as many working solar panels for as long as I can on my ground, along with cover, for as long of the year as I can. So maximising the solar cycle, yeah, that's the whole approach of those multi-species in crops, getting more green on the land with diversity above and underneath the ground as much as you can and same with uh, ecological, holistic grazing, whatever you want to call it. In this case about 4,000 sheep. I thought we had big mobs until I saw a film last night, uh, 5,000 cattle in a mob. This is a classic case I stayed with. This is one of Savory's early clients in the tough country in the Karoo of South Africa, seven-inch rainfall country. Norman Croon sadly died the other day, but when he went out there in the 70s, all the land was like that desert on the right. He had to walk a kilometre to find a perennial plant. And he said about uh, regenerative holistic grazing, within 30 years he'd tripled his carrying and more than that his income. And that was just starting to get that cover up and the diversity in the perennials and the forbs and, and the whole thing. Quite transformative. We can show you plenty of examples in Australia. This, uh, if you see the red arrows in those top and bottom photo on the left, uh, that's the same tree as a marker in that landscape. And that land top left is your traditional, this is sort of subtropical grass country. Uh, absolutely flogged out for 100 years. Rock hard, so you can imagine you get a big tropical rain of six, 10 inches, 80% would run off. They then set about um, holistic grazing, mobs of up to 1,500 cattle. And uh, after 10 years, you can see the result bottom left. Regeneration, ground cover, regeneration of both grasses and shrubs. And uh, a bottom photo on the right, uh, that was once a steep-sided, actively eroding gully. That's now covered up. The battens are down to 45%. And I was talking to them the other day. They've now got gum trees starting to uh, regenerate in the bottom of that. This is northwest of Australia, remote, tough country. <coughs> this, uh, least country like some of yours. Uh, <coughs> no roads in here. You've got to fly in. So these people bought this cheap lease. You can see top right, uh, vast mobs of feral donkeys and cattle had, ha had hammered it to that extent. And they then came in. <coughs> and as Chris Hengler, the owner, told me, uh, our tools were simply animal impact, human ingenuity and solar electricity. And you can see the result, bottom right. And uh, I thought I'd show you a few cows in a mob until I saw the film last night. But there's some wonderful operations around. This is uh, in a recent drought, not far from me. This couple rotating um, 
well over 2,000 cows through and regenerating the hell out of their landscape. <coughs> Another example in, uh, in Queensland, further south, uh, same story. 150 years this time. This only took seven years, this regenerative approach. If you go left to right, you can see the transition in those seven years. Uh, once the country was given rest and animal impact, change started to occur until bottom right, uh, you've got full ground cover and, and great diversity of, of uh, uh, warm, cool season grasses, forbs and the whole lot. And then we've got the emerging space of pasture and cover cropping, uh, where it's integrally important are uh, holistically grazed animals within them because each benefits the other. So I'm telling people here to suck eggs because you've heard from Gay Brown and people like that, but just if those of you who aren't fully familiar, cover cropping uses a diverse, generally a diverse annual crop to create mulch, control weeds and improve soil health with animals grazing it. Uh, in other words, the cover of covering the ground and building fertility for the next crop or pasture. But if you're going to maximise that soil health, that animal impact density is integral. Pasture cropping, which evolved in Australia, a friend of mine, Colin Sykes, who you might have already heard, works with Gabe a lot. Um, with what we call the C4 um, warm grass warm season grasses, as they go dormant is the time that you're drilling in your edible cereals and canolas. And uh, through desperation he worked out that uh, that was a viable technique, uh, particularly if you graze it through the winter months. And just as the uh, grasses are waking up, you're taking off that grain crop. But again, animals are integral. This is also due to grazing, but it, it illustrates the impact on the water cycle of getting that soil health uh, transformed. So this is a, another savoury plant in uh, Mexico. Um, 27 years it took, or less than that, but that's the transformation. So that blue arrow and that, those photos is the same point in that landscape. So traditional overgrazed set stocked on the left. You can imagine how hard if you've got a big storm. That's why all that water is lying at the bottom of the hill. On the right, 27 years later, uh, no water visible, but you can bet at least 10,000 times more stored underneath. Totally transformative. And you can imagine production increases. And you would have all seen that. A paddock on the left um, starting to regenerate. Uh, you get a big storm, in this case over three inches in two hours, and I've seen photos equivalent uh, six inches in um, similar time or more. <clears throat> no runoff on the left because you've got healthy absorbent soil or in the process of getting there. That paddock on the right probably shed 70% of the water that fell because it had hard pan and it was, it was compacted. <clears throat> and I won't go into too much of the detail. This comes from the um, Kiss the Ground people, but... Um, we're all familiar with hard pans uh, or compacted soil in overgrazing and, and so the roots are going nowhere, they're not creating any soil biology, they're not creating air spaces and pockets with that biology for water storage compared to the untilled paddock on the right. It, it's quite dramatic uh, what Mother Nature will do if we allow her. Something we, we forget about, if we leave the soil bare, just how destructive rainfall itself can be. And uh, measurements show that uh, splash erosion on bare soil can deliver more compaction than tillage. It's a bit sobering. That's one of the many values of having cover laid down on your landscapes. Told you I was the wrong date of birth. Um, and this Beautiful illustration of uh, prairie, your prairie diversity. All, of, all those things penetrating deep, doing different function. We then get in and start industrial cropping or overgrazing, end up with a hard pan not far down, particularly with the annual short-rooted annual cereals. And uh, so you can see why uh, there's no water absorption occurring in those sorts of soils.
There's a reason uh, why uh, a lot of the uh, regenerative grazing people um, talk about uh, only taking half when you put into graze. Hopefully uh, no more than one bite and then lay down the cover. Uh, and this is a rule of thumb, it's not always exactly right, but basically it's pretty accurate that once you start taking more than 50% of the green matter in your paddock, you start to get an exponential die-off of your root mass underground. And so then the poor old plant, when the rain comes, has to crank up again by rebuilding a lot of those roots. Yeah, we need a bit of root die off to, as soil organic matter to feed the biology. But uh, that, that's a, a reasonable summary of, of why uh, not to take more than about half. And this illustrates very well this photo from the Land Institute. At Kearns is a prairie grass that's now, for the first perennial grass that's now producing commercial products. First of all, a beer, which is interesting, but now they're getting into flour. But that's your extraordinary soils here and the root depth, and then you can see what happens when uh, we start putting in an industrial system over that or, or set stocking. You just lose all that absorbency in your soils. <clears throat> and I won't go into this, but there's a whole other aspect of us managing landscapes, how we can slow water in our landscapes through uh, various methods I know you're good at here, um, just putting intervention, what we call leaky weirs in Australia, so the water can still get through and not destroy your structure, but you start to hold water and material up and eventually you can raise your water table. And a friend of mine, 8,000 acres of good basalt not far away, and um, just by instigating these sorts of practices, like knocking down an old set of cattle yards, using those posts to make a, a leaky weir in, in, uh, in a creek, He's now got a perennial running creek, which has risen about a foot. It's now going lateral. And one of the rarest species in the world, um, one of only three monotremes, egg-laying mammals, our platypus, has now returned in nine pools in his creek. Third cycle is, of course, uh, one of the critical ones, the soil mineral cycle. And the key, of course, uh, is biologically living soil. I, I sat through university soil courses about 38 years apart. Second time round, they were still mainly teaching chemistry and physics, not much biology at all. It's completely upside down. This, this is the great secret, this world underfoot, this magic biology. So they're the secrets, uh, not just earthworms and all the others, springtails and everything, but particularly the microbiology. And uh, if, if you go outside the plant life, 93% uh, of non-plant organisms are these, the microbial world. And it's, when we graze plants uh, and, and naturally, uh, their photosynthesis feeds these organisms through exudates, sugars, and decaying plant organic matter. And uh, with the fungi and, and the other microbes, uh, their part of the bargain of getting those plant sugars is to go out and access a huge diversity of nutrients and micronutrients in the soil. That's where the big health connection comes. And really, uh, a simplistic analogy, but most of our soils are upside down icebergs. Uh, we've got a bit of life, our livestock and others on top, and not much underneath. A really healthy soil should look like an iceberg. 60, 70 percent of life should be sitting under the ground, underneath those tons of livestock or whatever we've got on top. And, and that's what we need to be aiming for. <coughs> So I showed you your prairie photo. Uh, we're pretty good at doing that to soils. Uh, as a young and silly undergraduate, I used to do a lot of mountain climbing, and I was in New Zealand and encountered a huge patch of red ice on one of the glaciers. And the, uh, the, the Kiwi I was climbing with said, no, that's your Mallee drought. And he was right. So you can see the soil loss there. Millions of tonnes 
went off our, in a big drought, uh, went up to 4,000 kilometres and turned all the New Zealand Alps red. That's where all our, our, our nutrients and minerals ended up. Um, so we just don't, haven't been treasuring them. And, and so it comes back to relying on this healthy soil food web to make access of those and make them available to plants, us and our animals. And if you just look at one of the critical uh, organisms under the soil, the root fungus, the microhazal fungi, you can see that photo on the left. Uh, there's not much uh, fungal activity and, and, and virtually none of their micro feeding tubes, the hyphae. Uh, if you look at that photo on the right, in a healthy regenerative soil, it's vastly different. And research shows that in a really healthy soil, there can be up to, I've got 25,000 kilometres in a cubic metre, so about 15,000 miles of uh, these invisible fungal feeding tubes, uh, equivalent to a sort of uh, um, pickup truck, I think you call them, um, the back of a pickup truck. It's uh, you know, 15,000 miles of these hyphae in that sort of area. You go in and overgraze, plough, spray chemical, that's all gone. So, so those workers that are accessing all the nutrients for healthy food, healthy animals, healthy plants, that's all destroyed. And you're left up in a cropping situation, for example, with your drug addict plants waiting for their NPK. So pretty fundamental stuff. And I won't belabor the point, but the, the root fungi are critical players in the soil because they harbour so many other beneficials. In this case, uh, attacking a, uh, a parasitic nematode with, with the hyphae. About 2011, I was driving across the head of probably some of Australia's best soils, probably don't compare to yours, but these were rich alluvial basalt, uh, not alluvial, rich volcanic soils. And um, it was a dry season. I'd had about 30 odd points of rain the night before. I came through 12 hours later and here's water lying on these great soils. I hopped over. Those soils were thickly capped and totally dead. They'd been so overplowed, so over fertilised, so over sprayed. That moisture should have gone in five minutes and it's sitting here 12 hours later. And there's another aspect, if we take the cover off our soils and these precious organisms underneath, <coughs> you get what we've had a lot of in Australia in this recent summer, the temperatures over 40 degrees. You have bare soil. That's equivalent to your 108 degrees Fahrenheit or so. You go down about half a centimetre. Uh, your soil temperature, because of the, the baking effect, is getting up to 160 plus Fahrenheit. So you've got no life left under those conditions. Yet another reason to cover your soil. <clears throat> now I'll just give you an example of um, some radical stuff occurring in Australia, part of this new revolution. Now you guys would laugh. Um, those soils are about 3.8 billion years old. They're basically beach sand. I go and visit there, I feel I should take a beach umbrella and a beach ball or something. Uh, this couple, while the Western Australian wheat belt, which is the biggest in Australia, has gone into severe debt because of costs and droughts, they've grown from 600 acres to 30,000 acres. Ian there won't get in a tractor unless he's going to do over 200 acres a day. And they've radically turned this form of industrial farming upside down. They've come, when they go and plant their seed, they combine worm juice, vermijuice, with compost extract, wrap it around the seed, They've totally eliminated any industrial inputs. They're now getting 30 to 50% better yields than their neighbours. They're grazing it with animals, integral, at least a couple of times through the year. And um, they've basically reduced their costs because they've got no fertiliser or chemicals. So their profitability has sort of gone through the roof. Uh, and that's in some of the worst soils you could ever farm in. And they're calling it natural intelligence agriculture because the more they work, the more they're realising this is extraordinary intelligence and self-organisation under the soil, which I'll touch on in a minute. <clears throat> I should have had someone in their 30s 
doing this for me. Um, so this, just quickly on the Haggerty's, that's post-harvest, 2015. That fence line is the neighbour on the left. Uh, they had a bit of a windstorm, so it's already drifting into the Haggerty's paddock on the right. You look at the photos on the right, that neighbour's paddock is post-harvest. It's now got five, six months of 35, 45 degree temperatures to endure. Their paddock, after about six years of that sort of biological cropping, is now, uh, there's perennials and annuals and forbs appearing that uh, a lot of the uh, Department of Agriculture agronomists said were never in Western Australia, but they're appearing. And so you can see um, those, that photosynthesis is building soil right through the summer. Look under the microscope and you've got dead soil with no biology. Same area, 40 metres across the fence. That's what the Haggerty soil looks like in those conditions. Beautiful sticky networks of glomalin coming off the microhousal fungi, etc. And the result of all that is extraordinary soil aggregation, which is where we store water in those air pockets. And a good soil should have up to 50% of air spaces for that water storage. And you'd be familiar with this character. I was privileged to spend a few days with him last year and um, he's working on these same principles and revolutionising cropping and I know many of you have worked with Gabe and, uh, and are using multi-species cover crops. And, and it's at least 13 diverse species, over 20 in many places and using livestock to generate those soils and put cover down, etc. And as you probably know, he's got a book out recently, uh, but his five key principles, no, if possible, disturbance, but certainly limited, 100% soil cover or armour, huge diversity of plants and animals, keep those living roots working uh, as long as possible, punching out sugars, etc critically is putting animals into the system. <clears throat> a few years ago he took, he went over the neighbour's fence who's a traditional industrial farmer uh, and that's that clump of compacted soil is the neighbour's soil sitting on top of Gabe's soil. You can see the earthworms in the aggregation. That took less than 12 years and, and I, my guess would be if you took a penetrometer out Gabe's would be sitting around about 200 psi. The neighbours would be at least 1,000 psi. So your chances of getting water infiltration and storage are next to nothing in that industrial soil there. And Gabe's infiltration test, soil infiltration test now show this. It's pretty simple to do an infiltration test <coughs> with a bit of poly pipe. Uh, before he switched over, 91, his infiltration was about half an inch an hour. 11 years later, 2009, he was getting 20 times that, 10 inches an hour. And his most recent tests show that that first inch is going in, in nine seconds and the second in 16 seconds. That's where the revolution's coming from in resilience and productivity uh, and water storage. And we now have evidence, both in Australia and here, that um, we can increase our soil organic carbon by just 1%. Those soils become capable of storing, in our language, well over 140,000 extra litres of water, about 35,000 extra gallons per hectare in your, in your language. So that soil organic carbon, for so many reasons, and the building of aggregation is so fundamental. I'm going to skip through this quickly because uh, uh, Zach Bush tonight knows ten times more about this and, and the recent emergence of what's happening in the microbial world. But uh, I want to talk about some of the uh, newer thinking in quorum sensing and stuff, what's really going on under the soil. What's really happening in these complex communities is how nature works. That long co-evolved, always working together. So why in the hell do we think that under the soil should be any different to complex an ecosystem above the soil. And, and that's where we've started to go wrong. Um, we've destroyed that complexity and that co-evolved 
systems under the soil. And so it's this soil organic carbon, as I've been hammering, which is the key driver of our profitability, whether you're grazing or cropping. And to generate it, as I've been hammering, we need that animal density and, and the various new forms of cropping. But what happens then when you get that right? Uh, we get this remarkable self-organisation under the soil. Uh, it sort of leads to a tipping point and these extraordinary results. And we're now finding that the uh, plants and the microbes are talking to each other. And you take that the next step. If we eat food off healthy landscapes, the gut microbes in our body are talking to us. They're switching genes on and off. So if you can comprehend that, across the whole life spectrum, we're all talking to each other, not with Latin or English, but with a common, uh, a common chemical language. And to me, that's, that's just proof of how we've co-evolved to be intimately integrated. And I'm not going to go into the details. Um, I've been given a sort of 10-minute wave. Um, but it, it's absolutely magic stuff that happens un underneath. And uh, this extraordinary tipping point that occur occurs is called quorum sensing. When you get a, a sufficient density of the microbes underneath, it triggers these reactions, this communication, and the switching on and off of genes that leads to this remarkable soil building. Um, and I'll just give you one example, uh, not just soil building, but just one example that uh, in, in, once you get to this stage, this critical mass, and the plant's missing a bit of nitrogen, it's sending in um, sort of chemical messages, hormones, in this case, uh, flavonoid chemicals. It's telling the soil bugs, look, I'm lacking a bit of nitrogen. Uh, the message goes out, the uh, rhizobia bacteria come and form nodules and grab some nitrogen out of the air and away you go. And the same's happening with a disease infection in the soil. The messages go out and the uh, genes are switched on and off by the positive microbes with the plants, etc. And the attack bacteria, whatever, come in and attack the, the disease pathogen. Quite remarkable stuff. Uh, and would take a whole semester lecture uh, from people who know a lot more about it than me. And that's just a quick example of how the message has come down. Oh, the plant says I'm being attacked by some sort of pathogen, let's say a virus. Um, once you get critical mass, the, 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 the defensive positive bacteria or whatever it is comes in and, and takes out those, those uh, disease-causing um, viruses or whatever. And so really, it's, it's, it's this extraordinary combination of communication across species once you get to this soil health to a critical mass. So the question is, <coughs> if we're going to do those things to our environments, what chance have we got of this remarkable self-organisation occurring in the soil? Uh, in our language, bugger all. Um, it doesn't occur. Now, look, I'll only skip through now so I can finish. Um, the, the fourth function, of course, is biodiversity, dynamic ecosystem communities. <coughs> uh, one quick example. Uh, this family, we've flipped into another system here. Anyway, I'll go back. Yep. Uh, on the left, they got down to only 2% of the original vegetation, natural vegetation. They were getting all sorts of problems, dry land salinity, animal performance dropping because there was no shelter, disease attack of pastures. That strainer post on the left there is the same post uh, that they're leaning on on the right. So that's the same point in that landscape. They brought the landscape back to 22% of vegetation. Despite taking out 20% of the land, their production's gone up 40%. Um, better animal performance, better lambings and calvings, less disease attack. They've also stacked in another seven enterprises, both from the agroforestry and cut flowers and, and, and farm tourism and that sort of stuff. So their overall income has gone, their overall profitability has more than tripled. That's just working with biodiversity function. And there's all sorts of ways which I won't go into. I've had the privilege of working with Fred Provenza, who woke me up to the fact that I thought horizontally too much. 
We have a great capacity with a vertical grazing landscape, uh, shrubs uh, with both uh, nutrients and uh, uh, with things like tannins that destroy anthelmintic attack. And um, there are tens of thousands of phytochemicals, micronutrients in, in, in shrubs, and, and uh, many of us haven't thought about that. And just quickly, uh, what are called silvopastoral systems, uh, animals grazing in, in a landscape where they get food off the trees, such as oaks, they've been around for centuries as well, and people are rethinking that, especially in treeless country as we get climate change. So quickly addressing the Anthropocene, I'll just wrap up. Um, I've had the privilege of working with Paul Hawken, who's written the book Drawdown. He's got 70 scientists to analyse the top 70 methods of pulling carbon dioxide out. Seven or eight of them are regenerative ag, and I pointed out to him, if you call them all regenerative ag, by nearly two and a half times the next best method, we have the best solution to pulling down carbon out of the atmosphere. So we're number one in addressing that and many of the other key Anthropocene uh, uh, destabilised Earth systems, including all those that I listed before. So I'll just fi finish. With the final one, I'm not going to tread on uh, Zach Bush's territory, but um, we have a huge impact here because if we put healthy nutrients into our soils and get rid of chemicals, it has a huge impact uh, on human health. Sorry about this. And that's a, a simple example. Um, you kill off the soil biology, you're destroying food nutrient density and availability without all the other impacts that we know glyphosate, et cetera, is having. And that's just one of dozens and dozens and dozens of papers now showing how once industrial agriculture came in, the nutrient density, and micronutrient density, mineral density in our modern foods have absolutely crashed. Not just in vegetables, cereals, fruits, uh, across the whole spectrum, meat, dairy products, they've all crashed compared to early records, all because we have destabilised the healthy ecosystems off which we grow food. And, and that could be another way of viewing human evolution. You'd almost guess the brand name on the milkshake container, if you like. Uh, if it wasn't so true, uh, it would be funny. And of course, the elephant in the room is glyphosate, uh, but almost certainly it's going to be banned and then a lot of the industrial world will be scrambling, but uh, we now know we can farm regeneratively without it. And uh, I'll leave that to Zach, but its implications for things like epigenetics, where we pass on um, through succeeding generations, particularly on the maternal side, uh, our genes are constantly interacting with the environment and, and that, that is now heritable because it's not changing the DNA, that interaction, but it's the switching on and off of those genes. And I won't go into that because I'll, I'll, I'd like to wrap up. So my simple answer to the healthy food uh, issue is just one slide, a healthy soil biology. So in conclusion, <coughs> that's dramatic, yeah. As a species in a planet, we are on the edge. Uh, but I think what I'm arguing today is that the approach of regenerative agriculture has the best solutions to planetary, environmental and human health issues. So I'm not depressed, I'm very optimistic. And as Gus Speth said in his, his great book, The Bridge at the End of the World, today's problems can't be solved with today's mind. We need to change the square foot of real estate. Or as, a, as an old farmer said to me the other day, the thinking that got us in the shit won't get us out of the shit. <coughs> 
And your great environmental historian, Donald Worcester, has laid down three great principles for good farming, I think. Making people healthier, promoting a just society, and preserving the earth and its network of life. It's a pretty good philosophy to follow. <clears throat> and so I guess I'm arguing we've got to make that shift from the mechanical to the organic mind, but using both. The best of modern science, but now regarding ourselves as indivisible to Mother Earth. So that combination is how we're going to do it. And so I, I present to you the law of the turtle. Behold the turtle, he makes progress only when he sticks his neck out. And so I'll finish. <coughs> if I can work this thing. Um, to summarise what I'm saying about regenerative ag, our fraternity has most of the key solutions to the Anthropocene crisis, in my view. We have an agriculture that heals natural systems, and we have many of the key solutions to this exponentially growing human health crisis. And so my final thought, which came from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was executed deliberately by the Nazis second last day of the war. And he's, I'm saying that we need a new story, a new great story we tell ourselves as a culture, not economic rationalism and greed and growth, but this one that he spoke, that the ultimate test of a moral society is the kind of world it leaves to its children. And we have the capacity to leave a healthier world to our children. So I'll leave it there. Thank you.